Hey students, it's good to see you again. Uh, what I want to do in this uh, lecture is let you know the overview of how we're going to approach the knowledge of God this semester. And so this lecture is called Approaching the Knowledge of God, Seeking Faith, and the PEP wager, that stands for Proper Epistemic Position, and I'll let you know more about that as we go on. But I wanted to give you a, a sense for of my approach to to God, either bringing myself back to God, you know, obviously it's God who brings us to Him, or helping someone come to faith. What does that process look like? And it's also the process that we will be going through over the course of the term. So this is how we're going to be approaching the knowledge of God. First is preparation, and there's a real spiritual preparation that we need so that we approach our ministry or our search for understanding ourselves with the right heart and the right focus. And so personal preparation is crucial. This is not a sales pitch where by our own power we bring someone to faith. Uh, this involves uh, getting prepared spiritually. The second step is groundwork. A lot of times people act as if the, the problem uh, that leads to doubt is that people don't have enough arguments for God. And so they just start giving arguments left and right. What we're going to do is look carefully at who we are as people. And then you want to prepare the groundwork for someone to be able to be open to searching for God and experiencing God and the arguments that are available for God. So that's epistemic preparation. It's preparation of the mind, and it's learning some things in the field of epistemology, which is the study of knowledge and, um, and opinion, truth, and evidence. And inspirational preparation, reviving the desire for there to be a God, uh, or maybe creating it for the first time. That's really important before someone addresses uh, arguments, or before you start dealing with reasons for doubt. And then the next step for the semester and for this approach to the knowledge of God will be arguments for Christianity. And these will be arguments that for theism itself, just for the existence of God, and arguments that are particular to Christianity. And then, finally, we respond to challenges to the Christian faith. We're going to be arguing in the groundwork section that belief in God is properly basic, which means that we can come to know God directly through experiencing God. And so arguments are not really necessary for knowing God. But then we encounter challenges that bring us to have a lot of doubts. And when we encounter those challenges, we sometimes are going to need arguments to help us respond to those challenges. And so this is the, uh, the pathway towards the knowledge of God that we will be looking at the rest of this term. The preparation, the groundwork, that's epistemic and spiritual, arguments for Christianity, and responses to challenges. And so I just want to touch on each one of these a little bit uh, in this short lecture. The first thing is personal preparation. Uh, the personal groundwork that we have to do is to grow uh, in love, in humility, in all the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, sometimes we can find ourselves preaching or talking or sharing or telling, and we're not living. All of our energy, all of our wisdom uh, comes from walking in the Spirit and abiding in Christ, and that's a, a very important thing to start with. And there are also some practical steps that we are taking a look at for how to engage fruitfully with people in conversations and making genuine connections with them. The next part of personal preparation that I want to bring to you is just some of the details. First is that our eyes need to be on God. Uh, and this is one of my favorite verses. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the next. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Our personal transformation comes from keeping our eyes not on the problems of the world, not on our suffering, not on uh, the things that are pulling us down, but on God. And as we keep our eyes on God, we are promised that we will be transformed to be more like him. So it's important for us to spend time with God. 
that we will develop an intimate knowledge of God. So when we respond to someone's challenges or someone's doubts, we do so with the Spirit of God and with the wisdom of God. It's also important to emphasize that it's not our job to help someone uh, overcome their doubts. It's the Holy Spirit's job. Uh, Jesus said that he would send the Comforter and that the Comforter would convince the world about sin and righteousness and judgment. But the way the Comforter works is to use us. So let's not put the primary responsibility on our shoulders. Let's learn to, to listen carefully, to hear the nudging of the Spirit, and then to allow God to work through us. And this is another one of my favorite verses about Jesus being the vine and us being the branches. So this is not a kind of work that you need to stress about. You pray, you leave it in God's hands, and you see if he sends some of that vine juice down your branch uh, to produce uh, a flower or to produce some fruit. Uh, we also need to really come to understand ourselves. And we start off this semester talking about the kinds of of biases that we all have, our quirky brains, and how those thinking errors that we make are sometimes connected to issues of character. So it's really important for me to face my own fears and my own security, insecurities and my desires, and I need to reflect on how do those impact me? How do they impact how I approach the experience of God or evidence for God? And as we do this and go through this process seriously ourselves with integrity, uh, we will be equipped to lead others through that process as well. Because just as we are subject to various biases, whoever is dealing with doubt that we might be ministering to, they are filled with fears, with insecurities, with desires, and all of those shape how they see and process experiences and information. So we have to go through the process ourselves and then we can help lead other people through that process. And then it's so important that we serve others in practical ways. And I know that everyone in this class has done this. Uh, God puts someone on your heart and you go and you, they need you. They need someone in particular and you are that person and, uh, and God leads you to do that work. Working with God really binds people together. I used to teach in the first year seminar program at Roberts Wesleyan and we'd always do a service project together. And it made the students feel so close to one another and close to their, their teacher. And the same thing is true when we are led by the Spirit to do work and service for others, we get bonded to, to God in a special way. Uh, and again, we want to be close to God as we go through this process. And then, since we're talking about having discussions with other people, uh, we want to practice uh, the, the, the virtues that are required for civil and fruitful discussions. Openness. Being really open to another person. Everybody wants to be respected and everybody wants to be heard, not just listened to. And so we need to practice really being impacted by what other people say. Even if there's someone who doesn't share our faith or even if there's someone who is attacking our faith, we trust God with that, so we want to be open, have open hearts. We want to have intellectual humility. And that means that I hit the mean between not having any confidence in what I know and what I've learned and believe and being arrogant about it so that I don't listen to others. People can smell arrogance and they're just not interested in talking with someone who is arrogant about what they believe. Uh, we want to be open, empathize with other people, be real and vulnerable with them. And so this is uh, the personal preparation that we need. And uh, we also need some practical strategies. And you've uh, looked at some of those, or you will be looking at some of those, in the document strategies for civil and fruitful discussions. I think these are very practical strategies for interacting with someone who thinks very differently with us on something. It could be politics, it could be social justice issues, ethics, and it certainly could be with regards to uh, the existence of God and the ways in which God works in the world. So that's our personal preparation uh, before we even go on this journey of helping uh, other people with their doubts. Then there's intellectual groundwork. So if whether you are doubting yourself and you're going through this process or you're helping somebody uh, uh, to go through this process, it is important for them to, to learn some things that have been worked out by philosophers in the field of epistemology. 
Um, people will say, well, you can't know that Christ exists. Nobody knows if there's a God or not. Everybody believes different things. Well, there's been a lot of study for centuries on that word knowledge and what knowledge requires and uh, about being justified in one's beliefs or being rational in what one believes. And we're going to start with some very important work here that will help, I, I think, um, set us off on the right grounds. What people need to know is that for every kind of knowledge, there is a proper epistemic position. Episteme is the Greek word for, for knowledge or opinion uh, and or evidence. And uh, we need to be in the proper position to know something. Uh, if I need to know what the temperature is in Houston right now, I need to be in the proper epistemic position to know that be in Houston with, the therm with a thermometer or, uh, or be on the internet looking up that information. So what does it mean to get into the proper epistemic position for knowing God, right? So what we will do is help a person first reflect on their situation with regards to knowing God. Are they in a good place where they can be a good judge of whether or not there is a God? So the person will reflect on their own epistemic situation. And then when they do that, I think they will learn to respect the epistemic situation of theists and Christians. Um, they won't say things like uh, Richard Dawkins says, that faith is believing what you know ain't so, or that there's no evidence for God's existence. Because we're going to study what evidence is, and it will become very clear that there is strong evidence for God's existence, even before we get to arguments. Uh, and so this person will come to know their epistemic position, They'll respect your epistemic position, and then they'll understand what it would mean for them, what changes in their lives they should take, so that they will be in a good or proper epistemic position to know that God exists. Um, we, we realize that if we want to understand uh, physics, we have to take a physics class. That's the proper epistemic position for taking physics, or for understanding issues of physics. Um, if we want to know uh, about childbirth, we're pregnant for the first time, uh, we read books or we go to classes, that's putting ourselves in a proper position to know the truth about this experience that, that's going to happen. Uh, but why do people think they don't need any preparation or, or, or the, uh, to, to uh, prepare themselves to be in a proper epistemic position to know God? Uh, by the time they go through this, this first stage of intellectual groundwork, they will, they will realize gosh, I've been a little bit uh, prideful, um, I should humble myself, and I should put myself into a proper epistemic position for knowing God. Because for the kind of knowledge we're seeking, knowledge of God, who is by definition an infinite being, beyond all time and space, uh, an uncaused cause, uh, beyond our ability to, con to truly conceive, uh, getting in the proper epistemic position for this kind of knowledge is going to be um, uh, difficult, or at least it's going to take some work on our part. So it's going to involve intellectual preparation, spiritual character preparation, um, and we have to make intentional choices to put ourselves in the position uh, where we might be able to experience the reality of God. And so that's, that's the first uh, section of the course, the intellectual groundwork getting into a proper epistemic uh, position. And then there's inspirational groundwork. Um, there are people who don't want there to be a God. And many of us maybe are in that place or have been in that place. Like, I don't want there to be a God. Um, Christopher Hitchens has a famous rant. Uh, he's a, uh, he was an atheist thinker um, where he says that uh, he is very glad there is not a God. And he says, why? Um, and, uh, and so if someone doesn't want there to be a God, we've talked about the various biases that we can experience as human beings. If they don't want there to be a God, it's going to be hard for them to experience God. And it's going to be hard for them to fairly judge the evidence for God's existence. So um, you want someone to be in a place where they say, gosh, if there could be a God like this God you're describing, that would be wonderful. It's just I don't see the evidence. That's a good place to be. Much better than, I don't want there to be that kind of a God, and there is no evidence. So you start with some inspirational groundwork. You start by helping the person desire for God to be real. I shared with you in my testimony um, that when I lost my faith in college, uh, I actually still desired for there to be a God, um, because I had gotten such a sense of meaning and love and hope and strength when I did believe 
that when I lost my faith for a while, I still had that desire for God to exist. But a lot of us go through periods of time when we don't want God to be real. And we need to paint a picture of God that is uh, lovable and inspirational for them so that they might at least get into this place where they say, oh, I wish there was a God like that. That would be amazing. <sighs> if there was only evidence. And then you can say, oh, well, there is. Let's talk about it. So if God exists, then so much of what we value is going to make more sense and so much of what we value as human beings, we have hope will come to complete fruition. And I'm going to give a list here and not go through it because we're going to be doing that during the semester. But this inspirational groundwork is to say, hey, you're a human being. You have these natural desires and, and intuitions and abilities. If there is a God, that makes more sense. And if there is a God, there's going to be complete fruition of those things. And so doesn't that make you want there to be a God? And so uh, there's a number of things we'll talk about. Uh, reason and science, love and relationships uh, make more sense, uh, not only on the existence of God, but on the Trinity. Our belief in rights, justice, and ethics. Our belief in goodness. Um, our experience of sin and shame and our desire for there to be a solution for that. Uh, the concept of truth that is so foundational to us makes so much more sense if there is a God than if there isn't. And the same thing for meaning, which we, as uh, we talk about in uh, the lecture on um, our, our various sorts of biases and brain quirks, we desire meaning. We're narrative beings. And that fact about us can only come to fruition if there is a God. And then finally, we desire, not finally, I'm putting eight and nine together, but stability and and permanence. We desire eternal life. We want to believe that beauty is actually real. And C.S. Lewis talks about the times in which you experience beauty, and it's so profound that you want to get into the beauty. And we'll talk about how that is actually the promise of God. So in, in this, we've had intellectual groundwork, uh, which really has to, you have, we have to correct some, mis, uh, some misapprehensions that people have about what it takes to know things. And then the inspirational groundwork helps them desire for God to be real. Um, and then we can talk particularly about the Christian God, um, uh, which, uh, um, you know, I'm happy to help someone become a theist, but there's no one like the Christian God. And so some of the things we'll talk about this semester is the humility of God in Christ, God's gentleness towards us, God's respect for us, you know, his respect for our freedom. The fact that God himself became one of us and was a suffering servant, not uh, sitting up on a throne saying, hey, y'all come to me. No, he was a suffering servant who sought us out. Uh, God's eternal faithfulness in Christ. And then the mystery that stills the heart. Sometimes people will say about the Trinity, ah, oh, that's just a contradiction. How can God be three persons but one substance, one God, three persons? Well, uh, if you're looking at the nature of the ultimate being, and you're trying to describe that being, you should be reduced to metaphor, to poetry at some level, or else I think that you've just made up that God. That's a, that's a man-made God that you can explain perfectly and logically everything makes sense. Uh, a, a, it, uh, an approach to God should make sense, but when you start to describe the very nature of God, there should be mystery because our, our minds are not yet ready in this life to fully understand it. So I expect mystery from the true religion and the mystery of the Trinity and the mystery of the incarnation that God could be fully, Jesus could be fully God and fully human. Uh, seems to me to be the right kind of mystery. And we'll talk about that. And then uh, we all have ethical vision. We all have a desire for goodness and character. And we'll talk about how there's a higher ethical vision uh, in uh, Christianity that's very inspirational. And, uh, and we also have help from God to reach it. So those are some of the things that I think can help people fall in love with the Christian God. And we'll talk about them this semester. Then, and only then, well, we talk about arguments for Christianity, right? We, we want to do the preparation first, and then we talk about arguments. And, and this comes down to the fact that we are not, like many of us have been taught, 
objective evidence evaluators. Uh, and especially when it comes to something that is the most personal thing of all, which is God. And whether there is a God and whether we have a relationship with God. So there are two kinds of arguments for Christianity and theism that we'll look at. First, they fall, the first group falls into this category, that Christianity makes more sense of the universe and the life that's in it than atheism does. Uh, so Christianity makes more sense of this universe and the life in it than atheism. And these are the kinds of arguments we'll be taking a look at. I won't describe them here because we're going to have fun looking through them this term. Cosmological arguments, teleological arguments, arguments based on the fine-tuning of the universe, arguments from the existence of consciousness or awareness. We'll talk about things people have experienced with near-death experiences, scientific theories of multiple dimensions and, and how that speaks to the possibility of some of the truths of Christianity, uh, and of course the resurrection of Christ. Uh, all of uh, these issues in the universe and the life in it make more sense on Christianity than on atheism. And then we're going to take a look at human experience and say, look, uh, if Christianity is true, then uh, the aspects of human experience that we all share make a lot more sense. And I mentioned some of these in the section where we're sort of helping someone desire for there to be a God. Um, and there are a bunch of them here. And so we're going to look at specific arguments for Christianity and ways in which the Christian faith makes more sense out of human experience than any other approach. So we started with our own personal preparation that, that is, that is uh, spiritual, and then we prepare the person we're talking with uh, in, in correcting epistemic errors, setting the groundwork for an understanding what knowledge, evidence, and reason is, and then we have the inspirational preparation, help them desire for there to be a God, and then we have our, our arguments for Christianity. Uh, and what we finish with is responding to challenges. So I'll be lecturing on uh, the notion that belief in God is properly basic, which means we can actually know God through experiencing God. And it's properly basic, just like my perceptual beliefs and memory beliefs. And for instance, the belief that you all, each one of you is a person who exists that has a mind like me. Uh, all of those are things for which there's no uh, non-circular arguments. Uh, it's things that we know directly. And so even though we know those things, there can be defeaters for them. Defeaters for Christian belief are, um, are either experiences, they can just be weird experiences, random experiences, or arguments that um, cause us to doubt whether we really are rational in believing in God and in Christ, whether we're really uh, uh, rational in, uh, in living as we do. And so what are some of these challenges? I've listed some of them here. Uh, the epistemic challenges to believe in Christ. You don't have enough evidence. You don't have proof. We're going to be starting off with that. Um, the, the problems of suffering and evil. This is probably, I would say, the number one uh, uh, challenge to people, the number one cause of doubt is the suffering that they have experienced, the evil in the world, um, uh, uh, the suffering that others have experienced. So we have to talk about that. A related issue is the hiddenness of God. Now, for many of us, the existence of God is obvious. We've met God. Uh, uh, we can't imagine there not being a God. But relatively speaking, there is some hiddenness to God. Uh, people have, have said, look, if God exists, why doesn't he come down right now in the, in the sky so everybody in the world can see him and say, I exist, I'm right, read your Bibles. Uh, we'll talk about why that would be a terrible thing for God to do, actually, and that the hiddenness of God actually is a clue to um, some of God's wonderful characteristics in, in the ways in which he treats us. Um, we'll talk about science. Some people think that science disproves God or disproves Christianity. Some people have concerns about the teaching of hell. It seems unfair to them or unjust. Some people think that the atonement doesn't make sense. Uh, the atonement is the, the death of Christ on the cross for us. Why couldn't God just forgive us? Why did he have to die for us? And so we're going to talk about that. And then religious pluralism. You're saying that I should believe in Christ, but what about Islam? What about Shintoism? What about, um, what about Hinduism? Uh, what about Judaism? 
uh, and, and, uh, and every other religion in the world. Uh, why, why should I believe that Christianity is true? And, uh, and what does that mean uh, about the fate of others? Uh, so religious pluralism, these are, uh, cha these are, uh, this is one of the challenges that we'll face and talk about. And then controversial social issues. And um, there are a number of controversial social issues that when Christians take stands on them, this will keep some people from God. And so we need to talk about them in this class. So what, ha what, are, what are we doing? We're preparing, and then we're doing a spiritual foundation, and we're, we're, um, we're doing intellectual foundations, and then we're looking at arguments for Christianity of two different sorts, and then we're responding to challenges. Uh, and then this leads a person uh, to a choice. And we're going to read William James, and I think that's going, going, going to really bring things into focus about the choice. Because each one of us, when we get the evidence that we really know that we need, we should recognize we have it, then we have to make a choice to give our lives to God and to, to really open ourselves up to the existence of God. And so this is how I think that choice uh, will happen for yourself if you go through this process or someone that you take through the process. And, uh, you know, before I go through these four steps here, I do want to say uh, this is not, uh, doesn't have to happen in these four ways. This is the way that makes a lot of sense to me uh, because of who we are as human beings and because of what I've studied. But obviously there are many ways in which people come, come to Christ or, or recommit to Christ. Uh, but I find this helpful and I'm hoping you'll find it helpful and or interesting. So the person that we've been sharing with understands uh, what her epistemic position is now. So you know what you know about your epistemic position, about what you've experienced, your experiential evidence and your argumentative evidence. I had a, I had a, a student once who was a pastor's son and in, in, um, uh, it had experienced Christ and it made sense to him, but he decided to be an agnostic in high school because he felt like he should have proof for the existence of God, that, you know, the kind of proof that you might have that's mathematical in nature. He took a course in epistemology from me and came back to faith. God used that. He understood, wait a minute, I've had unrealistic expectations about what evidence is and what it is to know God. So we want the person that we talk to, to um, if they have unrealistic expectations, we want them to be very clear about what evidence is, what evidence is available, and what arguments can do and cannot do. And then they should reflect on their personal position. Because the existence of God is something we come to, to be aware of, or the knowledge of God is something we come to with our whole selves. You know, uh, you might say that the, um, uh, that the uh, uh, you know, you might say that uh, a telescope is the tool that you need to, to be able to look at the rings of Saturn. But your whole self is the tool that you use to know God. So you would say that this person would be able to say, what is my position now personally? How have I changed personally through these conversations or through going through this search? What are my existential realities? Let me be real with myself. Who am I? What are my faults? What are my problems? What are my needs? What are my desires? So what is my epistemic position? What is my personal position? Then a commitment to integrity. What is at stake for me personally? And again, when we read William James, we're going to realize that there are certain genuine options in our lives. These are, these are uh, significant choices that we must make that we can't opt out of. And if we have integrity, we realize whether I follow God or not, there's a lot at stake uh, personally and in terms of my claiming to be a rational being. And pra practically, now that you know what you know, Will you respond with integrity? And then finally, it comes down to a choice. And that choice can be as simple as, it's worth knowing God if God exists, and so I'm going to throw myself Godward, which means I'm going to open myself up to the existence of God, who is the source, if he exists, of all truth and goodness and beauty and meaning. So yes, I'm throwing myself in this direction. I'm going for it. That's the choice. And I do believe that when we do that with a whole heart, that faith follows. I want to finish up with something uh, that you probably have heard of before, which is Pascal's Wager. Uh, Pascal's Wager, as an argument, uh, the way that it's usually given, I don't think is very good. 
in critical thinking, we talk about um, we talk about the fallacy of an appeal to force, which is believe this or I will hurt you. Right? That is a that is a terrible fallacy, and sometimes people come to believe in God out of uh, being afraid that God will hurt them, and I don't I don't think that's how God would have us come to Him. Um, the basics of that argument is: look, you can either choose to lose nothing and gain everything. In other words, this life is so short compared to eternity. S- serving God in this lifetime is worth it, and you have a chance to gain everything. And if you decide to live for yourself, it's so insignificant that you're really gaining nothing, and you're you're opening yourself up if you're wrong to losing everything. So if you believe in God and you're and you're right, then you you receive everything. If you believe in God and you're wrong, uh, you won't even know. And if you don't believe in God and you're right, it's not much of a uh, of a gain for you. If you don't believe in God and you're wrong, though, it can be an incredible loss. That's kind of traditionally how Pascal's wager is discussed. During the semester, we're going to look at what I call the proper epistemic position wager. And uh, I'm going to go through it quickly now because we're going to talk about it this term. Um, and the proper epistemic uh, position wager does not have as its conclusion, God exists, or believe in God, even. Because we probably don't have direct control over what we believe, right? The conclusion is, uh, throw your life Godward. Throw yourself Godward. God, God, if God exists, is someone worth knowing. And it's worth throwing yourself that direction. That is, that is the conclusion of the wager, not believe in God or else. And so it basically is going to go like this. First, about true meaning and destiny. Knowing true meaning, true meaning in life, not just why well, I can f- kind of find meaning in my dog or my cat or this bit of work that I'm doing, but true meaning and, uh, and moving purposefully towards your best destiny is only possible if there's a God. If there's not a God, then it's hard to find true meaning in destiny because you will die and that's it. And eventually all of humanity will die. There won't be anyone to remember you or anything. But what if there is a chance that you could find true meaning and that you could move purposefully towards your destiny? Um, If so, then it's worth looking for, right? So, and then if I'm going to find the heart of all meaning and the the heart of of one's best destiny and and humanity's best destiny, I must admit that I can't just look around and say, ah, I don't see a God. I have to put myself in the proper epistemic position to know God. It's worth knowing God because it's the only way, only if there is a God, can there be true meaning and an ultimate destiny of complete perfection. And so uh, I should try to figure out if there is such a being. So if there is a God, it's indeed rational and pragmatic to put yourself in a proper epistemic position to know him. And if, if a person's gone through this process and they realize, oh, I want to have integrity. I realize I need God. I want God. I'm going to give this a try. Um, they, they recognize that they're, they're going to have to change some things, open their heart, maybe change some of the things they do, maybe spend some time in some ways that are different than they normally would spend it. Uh, and, and that is the second uh, premise. And then finally, you bring your whole self. You realize that you have a chance to find the ultimate meaning and destiny, the source of all truth, goodness, beauty, uh, and meaning. And since you have that chance, you've got to find out how do I put myself in that position. And so you would make space to encounter God. You would open your heart and your mind and you would start new habits. And so uh, this is the wager that I want to share with people at the end of this process to help them make that choice. So uh, I'm going to end here. And uh, again, I went over this quickly, but i um, it's, uh, I'm sorry, the air conditioner just came on. I apologize for the noise. It's supposed to be powered off. Um, but I wanted to go through this quickly to kind of prime you for what we're going to do this term. And then also, if you have questions or you think, oh, that's not going to work, or here's some things we should also talk about, uh, then you can address those with me as well. So thanks so much. And uh, I look forward to talking with you guys soon in the forums. All right. Have a great day, night, whenever it is you're watching this. Bye-bye.